Good afternoon and uh, welcome to everybody. That uh, I'm really pleased that you have joined this session to see how Dormer and Kappa leverages and deploys on Cloud Foundry. My name is Adriano. I'm, uh, I'm working at uh, Dormer and Kappa for the most thrilling projects. And uh, in the remaining time, I contribute and maintain some open source projects. And uh, most of them are used within Dormer and Kappa too. And uh, really often, I'm an unconventional thinker. I have always the challenge, or the, the, the drive to challenge the status quo. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, I'm uh, happily married with the best woman in the world, and uh, we have two beautiful kids. <laughs> and uh, this is Michael, not, m not my kid. Huh? <laughs> Michael. Yeah, um, I'm Michael, CEO of a newly founded consultancy uh, called Wilkli GmbH, Swiss term for small cloud. Uh, mainly focused on cloud technologies, such as Cloud Foundry. Uh, I don't have any kids, but two beautiful cats, so that's something. Well, um, who of you have heard about Dormer and Kaba so far? Raise your hands. Who knows Dormer and Kaba? At least the half of you should know them. <laughs> okay. Uh, these uh, digital components on the doors that you see on this conference, these are Kaba locks, digital Kaba locks. Um, I will try to tell you a little bit about Dormer and Kaba, a little bit and then we switch to more technical stuff. So the story of Dorman Kaba is a long story. It starts more than 150 years ago. On the Kaba storyline that you see there, uh, in 1862, the first locksmith shop opened. And on the Dorma storyline, in 98, Mr. Durkin and Mr. Mantko from the Dorma part started the journey too. We have a lot of years of experience that uh, merged together last year, 2015, in September, to form the new Dorma and Kaba group, from the Dorma group and the Kaba group. The merger has created one of the top three companies in the global market for security and access solutions, with uh, performance sales of more than 2 billion Swiss francs and around 16,000 16, employees. Dorma and Kaba is active in over 50 countries and has a presence through both production sites and distribution and service offices in all relevant markets. The growth, dri grow growth drivers that shapes our industry are the urbanization, with the infrastructure that determines security needs and the number of megacities that increases, the increasing prosperity in emerging markets with the terms, tourism that is on the rise all around the world, and people demanding protection for themselves and their property. The demographic change with an aging world population with consequences for building requirements. The increasing need for security caused by globalization and uh, more ge geopolitical risks. And the more obvious one that we focus on today, the technology. For example, the whole digitization with uh, Internet of Things, cloud computing in general, and changing business models, so like software as a service stuff. Our innovation portfolio is driven by market trends and customer requirements, technological trends and corporate strategy. Intellectual property management and product design is part of our innovation management. We are committed to investing in research and development in order to leverage on the opportunities of Dorman Kaba and the digital transformation of our industry. We are investing 4 to 5% of our annual turnover in an innovation and product development. One of our latest innovative solutions is Exivo. This logo here. Perhaps you have seen this in the internet somewhere. But what is Exivo? To have a rough idea what this really is, I will try to show it by a little explanation video. So now, this is Kaba Exivo. Kaba Exivo is the access solution for enterprises that need an access solution but don't want to waste time on it. So, how does that work? Very easily and conveniently, the doors in question are secured by electronic locking components. And uh, you decide, quite simply, who's allowed to open them and when. The access rights of every single medium can be changed or withdrawn at any time. Your Exivo partner does that for you. Kaba's web on the over the Kaba's web based solution, this is Exibo, a part of Exibo, leaving you to fully concentrate on your business. Or you can do it yourself. You choose which jobs are to be performed by your partner or if you prefer, prefer by, by you and yourself. 
You have full cost control and transparency of all, at all times. The monthly amount depends on new requirements. Once defined, it stays the same every month. Pretty cool, <laughs> didn't you think? I think so. <laughs> so for a company, I don't know, for those who know Coba from, from earlier, this is, this is really a big step. So from this 150 years of, of history, traditional company to come to such a, such a platform, you see it here on this picture, it's not just uh, a, new, a new access control solution, it's really one platform to, to rule them all, everything. The whole exp exp uh, customer experience chain is on that platform. So, for example, the partner can plan the doors, he can offer them, he can order them, the market organizations, they can review the order, they can accept it, the connected uh, factories can immediately produce the hardware, and uh, can ship the, uh, that hardware, that, that door part, and uh, the customer had, has an immediate access to the platform, to its customer application part of the system. So, in cloud native app speaking, we can say, yeah, our front-end apps are on Cloud Foundry. So all these customer, partner, market organization, administration, support, and a lot more, the most of them are a single page application written in React. All this is on Cloud Foundry. But our backend services, our backend apps, are on Cloud Foundry too. So the whole business domain stuff, all these identity management, web servers, a lot of APIs and workers, all this stuff is on Cloud Foundry. Our IoT stack is completely on Cloud Foundry. So the whole end-to-end real-time communication between the business part and the IoT devices, that all that is on Cloud Foundry. So messaging, signing service, authentication, firmware update, virtual device representation, and a lot more. And you can trust me, there are a lot of security topics in, in, in this area here. <laughs> and uh, I think we can proudly say that this IoT stack is now, today, in production on Cloud Foundry. So yes, the whole business model, the whole customer experience chain is on Cloud Foundry. So from acquisition to lifecycle management, everything. So everything is a service, right? Everything is a service. We, we do not just deliver just products anymore. We, we, we deliver, maintain, and sell services. So we can say everything is on Cloud Foundry, right? <laughs> but why? Who does this? <laughs> Yeah, this is the explanation, okay? Yeah, we, it's, we are motivated to do everything on Cloud Foundry. It's, it's fun, it's cool, eh? and it's not a joke. It's really not a joke. It's, it's, it's seriously. Uh, we at Dormacaba, we, we really wanted to focus from the beginning on the application part and nothing else. So we don't want to grow know-how in, in, in your po topics like OpenStack stuff or we don't even want to, to maintain or operate our own pause. No. We want to concentrate on our applications. That's why uh, we were, first of all, looking for a great pause solution. And this is obviously Cloud Foundry. <laughs> and then for an extraordinary partner, and not just a common service provider. And for us, this is Swisscom. So, okay, let's, let's make a little, little step, okay? Um, can you raise your hands if you deploy more than five apps in parallel to production? More than five, huh? okay. More than 10? 15? 20? 50? Okay, perhaps you can talk a little bit more afterwards. <laughs> okay, we have approximately 80 cloud native apps per stage. Huh? per stage, divided in two bigger parts. So the whole business domain parts, the, all these front end and back end apps that are related to the business, and the IoT stack separated. Uh, that way, all this customer or business information uh, are not influenced in, in, in the IoT stack. So the IoT, IoT stack doesn't, doesn't know nothing about the whole, the whole business part, just focused on all this end-to-end -end communication, security stuff, and so on. So all these yellow uh, points that you see here on, this, in this, on these graphs, on these illustrations, are, are apps, are really apps. And these uh, black lines are app-to-app -app connections. Oh, sorry. 
you don't see here any, any services visualized, but in the numbers, perhaps you have noticed that uh, we have pretty much so many, so, um, as many services as, as apps, approximately. And this is, for us, the nature of understanding microservices. But we have more than just microservices, okay? We have passwords. <laughs> we have other passwords, okay? <laughs> We have patterns, we have concepts. Some stuff like event sourcing and CQRS gives us great power to do really magical things. Because everything is loosely coupled, uh, this enables us to even replace programming language app by app without touching everything. The 12 factor app methodology is a great starting point to make cloud native apps. I really recommend that. The share nothing architecture approach gives us the possibility to even fastly replace uh, a database, a service, without touching the whole system. Because we have pretty much, for each microservice app, a service, a dedicated service. And uh, to be tolerant of failure uh, enforces us to write reliable code. For example, if the app detects that a connection to a service is broken, we kill immediately the app. This makes uh, the, the consistency of the system um, safe. Stuff like distributed domain driven design. This is this is really, this, this triggers us to to uh, think in, in in the intentional behavior of what we have to do and not directly in, in data or code. And I have to be honest, this is an approach that not every developer is good in. Huh? We directly try to imagine stuff and model in our brains and to, okay, we have, I have to do this function, this abstraction, and, and this data, and domain-driven design really triggers us to not do this. And uh, yeah, for everything we do, we have to be concerned really about security because, yeah, we, are, we, we, we make security, right? <laughs> Access control is important. And yeah, not just only security, but uh, multiple layers of security. <laughs> okay, let's have a look at our CI landscape. Huh? It's really more or less traditional. We have Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Jenkins, that does a lot for us right now. For example, by having access to our code, he can run unit tests, integration tests, end-to-end -end tests, do some reports. Uh, with help of browser tech, can do this nicely, end-to-end -end test stuff, and then, uh, yeah, the results can be right back to Jira, Slack, mail, and so on. Another job is the whole deployment. So we deploy to our Cloud Foundry instances. We use the Swisscom App Cloud as well as a virtual private Cloud Foundry installation, also by Swisscom. And both are offering the possibility to use uh, MongoDB, Redis, Atmos, RabbitMQ, and our preferred app runtime Node.js. And currently, all our apps are written in Node.js. Uh, we have six different stages, and each stage is also a Cloud Foundry space. For example, the develop st stage is fully automated to ensure that our continuous integration pipeline will work. So this means every time a developer commits code to our develop branch, this is our integration uh, branch, Jenkins does the unit tests, the integration test, and end test, then deploys it to the public cloud, to the public instance of uh, Cloud Foundry to use, and afterwards, it executes other integration tests and other end-to-end -end tests directly on Cloud Foundry. The test and the review stage, also deployed on the public cloud, are used to review some features, some feature branches, to test specific stuff manually, because we don't have just software, we have even hardware, the doors, firmware, and so on, different firmware versions, and so on, other systems in the back end, and this stuff can really be hardly automatically be tested. So we need a st sort of manual testing from time to time from, for different parts of the system. Then we have this sort of next um, stage. So I can say we have, we have a continuous integration pipeline that works automatically, but we don't have a continuous delivery that is automatically done. For this, we have this next stage that is deployed on the virtual private. There we choose um, the next release candidate and normally this, this happens every two weeks. The release candidate will be deployed there, and there we do some deployment tests, stress tests, specifically for this release candidate. And uh, afterwards, we push this stuff to the staging, 
staging stage, <laughs> also on the virtual private. And uh, on this stage, we have our in-house sites. So everything that Domer Kappa uses internally is deployed there, and all the doors connect there. And this is where we eat our own dog food, right? And this is just a measure to be sure that before we push this to production, we, on the first hand, we can just feel what we have coded, or if the features works. And after that, we deploy this to production, also on the virtual private. But now, let's take a look more deeper on this, on this blue arrow, on this blue deploy arrow. Yeah, so um, I'm now going to talk about the, the whole journey Dorman Kava has experienced on deploying on Cloud Foundry. Let's first check out where it all began. It started out fairly traditional with Cloud Foundry manifests and the good old CF push. So for each of these applications, in the initial development cycles, there weren't like 80 apps, there were like 50. Uh, for each app, you pushed it, you contextualized it, you bound it to services, you mapped some routes, everything manual. As you can imagine, that doesn't really scale well. Well, it scales with humans, but humans are hard to scale. So um, we, like probably everybody else, just wrapped the CLI in a shell script. So we started writing shell scripts and scripts that execute other scripts, and that grew kind of fast and was kind of slowish when you like to do all those actions and always wait for the action complete, uh, to complete. Uh, you wait quite a long time for an AT app deployment. So next logical step, parallelism in shell scripts can be done. So each app was deployed par in a parallel fashion, but then suddenly we started experiencing uh, failures in deployments like all over the place. Try to create uh, 50 service instances of the same type on a service broker on any provider. I'm wondering if this will work out. So um, we saw some errors. Next obvious step to do was to wrap it in a higher language to get some more proper error handling capabilities. So we wrapped our shell, uh, we converted the shell scripts to Node.js, wrapped the CLI there, had some nice abstractions around the CLI to, uh, so we could get some reliability in. However, still, we, we had unexpected failures. The CLI didn't give us the proper HTTP error code, so you had to like parse the text in the debug mode of the CLI. So it wasn't like really happy days. So at the end, we said, stop. We need something more sophisticated, something reliable, something flexible to do our application management. Um, so we started looking around how to do this. And a um, quick question in the audience, uh, who had a similar journey thus far with uh, deploying to Cloud Foundry? So who started with the, like the C, uh, CF push and then wrote shell scripts? One, two, yeah. And who then went further and expected the same thing in a higher language? One, one and a half, two, three, four, okay. So um, for those who went even further and came up with something what they call super sophisticated, please tell us. Because we were looking for stuff and didn't find really something. So what we did is uh, we created what is now called push to cloud. So what is push to cloud? Push to cloud is two components. Um, it's our software, it's open source software, that allows us to do uh, in separate uh, steps uh, proper state definition of all our Cloud Foundry entities, so apps, environment variables, routes, everything. <clears throat> and on the other side, we have workflows so that we can remediate the state on our current deployment. Uh, we separated those for the reasons I'm going to talk later. So let's start looking into what we call state definition. Of course, you start with your app. My app is called Fubar, needs a couple instances, disk, RAM, build pack, the usual stuff you have in ECF manifest, right? We added environment var variables to contextualize your application. You add service bindings. You want your app to be bound to services. This is all just you describe the state you would like to have. So you bind some routes. And then we, for instance, have a nice feature that you can define app bindings. So you define that your app needs to talk to another microservice. It's a usual case in a microservice architecture. However, it's a uh, not that, not that often a uh, first-class citizen in application configuration. So we uh, implemented it, for example, like this. It's just a plugin, but yeah. So if app A needs to talk to app B, app A in its environment gets uh, one of the routes exposed by this app uh, as a value, as well as username password for basic auth. So by just defining I need to talk to the other app, I automatically get where to connect to and how to authenticate that I'm talking to the right person. 
Um, so now we have your applications. And you have one or 80 in the Dorma Kaba use case. And often the times you, you need, uh, your versions kind of matter still. We still all dream from the, the version that we just continuously deploy each individual microservice directly into production. But sometimes version numbers are important as they're breaking changes. So you need to somehow orchestrate what is a release that we know that works. So this is what we call a release. We just define your apps, where to find them in Git, and which versions to use. And now we have this release, so we want to deploy this. This is then what we call a deployment. So for all the Bosch people in the room, this kind of starts probably sounding very similar. Deployment is just a definition of a target. Where do we want to deploy this release to? Which actual release to deploy? Uh, some defaults that we can polyfill into our applications, like uh, in production we want three instances as a default and the gig RAM, whereas in uh, development one instance and f uh, 512 megs of RAM is perfectly fine. Um, it, for in the deployment, we also do what we call service mappings. So uh, the app developer just says, I need a service binding to my foobar dash db. And here you can translate dash db for this deployment, uh, translates to mongodb large, or in the case of development, mongodb small. So this is done on a deployment level, as usually when you switch deployments, you kind of have a different mi uh, mindset, what you want to achieve there. Um, and also, we have our secret stores that you can configure. Currently, only support is HashiCorp Vault. So you define where to find your secrets. So the passwords we saw before in the app connections, those are gathered there. So now we have all those definitions. What do we do with it? Um, we just feed it into a compiler. So we've written this, this compiler. You feed in the deployment, and then it retrieves all the required files and gets you a deployment configuration. This deployment configuration is basically the same data, but just structured in another way that's easily machine readable. And this is a complete definition of everything you want to have happen on your Cloud Foundry. So when we now go back to the workflow components, we usually have an actual state, and now we changed something, so we have a new desired state. This new desired state can now be, uh, is complete with your deployment configuration. So you do your state definition, compile it, you have your desired state. Um, the format we've chosen in a way that we can easily retrieve the exact same data from Cloud Foundry. And now everybody that does a little bit of programming should know that uh, just diffing to data structures is kind of easy. So what do we plug in between? Workflows to remediate state. So how does this look like? Now comes a slide with some code. Watch out. Can anybody read this? Cool. So these are what uh, our workflows look like. So what you see here is an example of a blue-green workflow that's available up on GitHub. Uh, I've color-coded some elements I'd like to talk about a little bit more in detail. So first up, we have uh, in green at the very top, deployment config. So this is the parameter you pass in. I want to uh, use this workflow, and this is my new desired state. Uh, in blue, we have our API. API here is uh, basically your target, and we put your target information up into a Cloud Foundry adapter, so we can talk to one Cloud Foundry, and if the multi-cloud question is uh, something for you, uh, this could also be just an array of APIs, and then you talk to a whole set of Cloud Foundry endpoints and deploy your apps on multiple ones. Cl uh, push to cloud in theory is completely ready for this. Um, in yellow, we have what we call workflow utilities, so your traditional waterfall, do one step after another, or like map functions. So this was heavily inspired by functional programming. So you just map uh, a function like create the roots on missing.roots. So missing, again, is just a helper that gives you what uh, you have in your desired state, yet not yet in your actual state. And we have the same thing with old. So this kind of looks like a DSL, but just to be perfectly clear, this is JavaScript. So due to the nice dynamic na uh, nature, we can make them kind of look like a DSL. But uh, if you, at any point here, want to call out to your own service, like your ITSM, or uh, want to write an email, you can easily do this. It's JavaScript all the way through the workflow. So running out of time, uh, to quickly summarize, uh, we have the two components in Push to Cloud. We have the, the compiler that looks after your state definition and then merges that together into a readable format for workflows, which uh, migrate your state. Of course, we have a CLI to instrument the whole thing, and at the very bottom, we have a 
kind of awesome CF adapter. So if you ever have Node.js and want to do anything versus Cloud Foundry, at least have a look at the, the adapter. So very short, we believe with Push to Cloud, we have written something that is very sophisticated in application configuration. You've seen the whole circle thingies. We have Ador Macaba. Uh, we can deploy all those uh, complex microservices uh, easily with Push to Cloud. Once the, the state definition is there, changes are easy to make, and then the workflows, uh, workflows allow us to easily achieve this. Um, for us, important was also the strong notion of having a release in the deployment. So release, um, it's the whole water scrum fall story, right? We usually just deploy twice a year, so you need to be able to, to fix which versions to use. And deployment, obviously, if you want to deploy to multiple stages. Um, the whole thing is target platform agnostic, so it works on any Cloud Foundry certified platform. Just said, yeah. Um, the workflows are uh, easily customizable. Little example here, almost running out of time. Uh, Swisscom, for example, uh, just offered a new service plan with MongoDB with the newer version. And instead of migrating our data ourselves, we just wrote uh, a workflow, a workflow that pushes a Docker app, binds it to all the new services, create a new service, of course, and then migrates our data over with MongoDump, Mongo Restore, and then maps does the service back to our apps, and we're done. So even like normal operation tasks, we can use uh, Push to Cloud's workflow engine for. It's not just for your actual app deployments. Um, the whole thing, as we mentioned, is extensible. So we've taken a plugin-based approach throughout the whole piece of software. So if you want to use an other secret store than, for example, HashiCorp Vault, your own uh, proprietary one or whatever, it's just writing a plugin. So we have APIs, just implement those APIs, put the plugin in, and you're set. And it's all open source, of course. Um, some features with uh, Push to Cloud was presented last summit as well, that we, uh, some features that we've been working on. Uh, first of all, Docker support. We have support for, you can just uh, push Docker images instead. Uh, TCP routing is in there. Something we're really proud of is um, our retry and error, <coughs> me, uh, error statistics. So even though we've pushed to Cloud and retry abilities, so we can redo the, the whole curl requests until they succeed. Um, it would be nice to have some statistics which fail how often. So we now collect these statistics and can easily provide those to our provider. Um, and other uh, minor things such as a custom retry handler. So sometimes one provider has a different load balance in front of their API nodes and some calls return a slightly different error status than in the spec. Uh, you can now per provider have a different retry handler. So. Um, Who is all of this backed by? So we uh, have three partners at the moment in the whole Push to Cloud uh, project. It's uh, ZHW, University from Zurich, so academia is in there. We have Dorma Kaba, industry, and we have a service provider with Swisscom. So we have the three, I think, pillars of uh, writing cool stuff. So this is it. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yep, very back. Uh, avoid the manual change of your application configuration? For example, like maybe I'm in operations, I see this app is running out of memory, so manually I change the, um, the memory allocation for this app from mm -hmm. 512 to 1024 or max. And yep. the next time I push again, obviously it's still going to be reset to 512. Do you just do education with the off step, or do you have something in place to, to run in this? Um. Dorman Kaba, the ops guy, is basically that guy over there. So uh, it's, 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 it's uh, not a lot of uh, people show, but uh, we have currently have no safeties in place there. But uh, the DSLs, uh, the whole thing with the workflows is don't use the ones directly on GitHub, customize them to your needs. So if you often have operators uh, manually changing things, then just do a pre-flight check that if like, memory is higher set than I have configured, then take the, the current value instead of my configured one. So. Exactly this example we have at Dormacabo enabled. Exactly this example. Ah, okay. So for instances, memory and other stuff, that what, what was changed on the target and it's higher, then we take that and do not change it back to the lower. Yeah, that was another question. How big are your releases? How many applications do you have to release? Like all of them? 40 ones or are there different chunks? So as you have seen before, we have complete, on the, on the complete stack, we have 80 cloud native apps. And uh, normally, if we really can uh, uh, target these two weeks of release cycles, 
then most of all there are five to ten apps that should that changes. Uh, but if we made something groundbreaking, so on the on the on the, on the architecture part, or I don't know, uh, a month ago we changed the whole logging uh, library, then we have to update all apps uh, simultaneously. So it depends. It depends a little bit. But we can do everything. <laughs> Other questions? Um, yeah, we discussed about it, and uh, finally s s we said, okay, thought, okay, um, it will be really fast, really complex if we introduce some stuff, because everyone would do it a little bit different, and we have to deploy additional services, like something like console or something like that. And for that, we said, okay, for our use cases, we don't need it right now. It's okay that way, it's flat, but it's not so much, because everything we need is... The service part uh, is, are injected in the environment variable that we already have from Cloud Foundry. And our stuff is the credentials part, uh, not so much per app. We all have little apps and uh, these uh, app to app connections. So right now there is no inbuilt functionality for this, but it could be done with a plugin. <laughs> yeah, and this approach also has the benefit of it runs everywhere. So we need to have no external dependencies. We just use native Cloud Foundry features for what we call our service discovery. Are you using this information also for monitoring? So you have a dashboard patch that you can see which version is installed in which landscape currently and the state and maybe some more information? So we have monitoring. We have two um, types of monitoring. The, the one that we use really usually is uh, the one that offers Swisscom. <laughs> so the whole portal of uh, all these, these apps that are there. This is... Uh, a first step, and for more details, the details that come from the, the, the applications inside, we have uh, another monitoring system that with our custom-defined alerts, we can do monitoring stuff. So really, really specific to what we have there. So nothing, we have, not, have done nothing right now with the push to cloud tooling as itself. But what we have done is a little prototype uh, some time ago, only with the Cloud Foundry adapter of push to cloud, uh, we speak directly with the API and uh, retrieve the information in a certain interval and uh, we can show that up through uh, web sockets to a little uh, web uh, interface. But it's just to ha have made a little prototype, nothing that we use right now because Swisscom does the job right now for us. <laughs> Anything else? So okay, just if somebody interested, Dorma Kaba is hiring. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks you for having me. Thank you.